and um, yep. Just have well, thanks everybody for your patience as we uh, sort out the little tech glitch tonight. Uh, it's kind of a funny one. You know, it's kind of ironic for me that that even happened. I feel very like calm and zen about it because I uh, uh, I showed up tonight and I was feeling super scattered. You know, it's been Laura and I, my wife, we just got back from uh, 10 days in the back country and it was so nice to unplug and get off grid. Uh, we went up into this region called Tomogamy uh, up here in Ontario. Um, so, you know, literally didn't look at a phone or answer an email for a week and then just came back to just like a leaking pipe in our house and like uh, some mice issues and like a ridiculous work list. And it's just been nonstop for days. Um, and then even today was just super chaotic. So I, I showed up tonight and I was like, oh my goodness, I feel so underprepared. And I started feeling a little bit of anxiety. Uh, and then I went, and I'm like, you know what? I was trying to form out notes, but I was doing it in this very like Western way where I was trying to like jot them down. I'm like, I can't even string my thoughts together right now. <laughs> like, how am I going to present tonight? And I was like, you know what, Chris, like, forget this, like, just be you go outside take a breath of air. So I went outside and immediately I got hit by this like cool fall breeze that was coming in. There's a slight breeze kind of out of the, the Southwest tonight. Um, and then I look up and there's the moon, you know, we're on our way into full moon. Uh, and I kneeled down just in this little grass by this pine needle. And I just took a couple of long, deep breaths. Uh, and was like, okay, you know, this topic, like, why are you getting all worked up about this? That you talk about this every day of your life. This is just you. So take a breath. And then, so I came in and I was like, okay, I don't know what we're going to talk about, but I feel great uh, and ready to go. Cause this is just what we do. And then uh, I get in and Charles is like, Hey, we're having these tech issues and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, all right, it's all good. It'll work out. So, so I'm feeling great, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being patient. I'm sure a lot of people can kind of relate to that, that craziness that, uh, the world often feels these days as it spins so and it's it's nice to remember uh that we can go outside take a long slow breath tap into the moon the trees slow down and just remember who we are in this what our purpose is inside of this so uh, that's something i'm feeling thankful for tonight and, and you know i think it's really apropos we're like okay we're going to talk about you know uh, remediation mushrooms disaster and you're like oh things aren't going as planned like like and that, that's just how it goes. Like, you're like, oh, we've got a plan. Like, and you're like, okay, and it changes. And that's just part of how it is. Like, and whenever we work with natural systems, it is the, how, how nature works. It is like the general and then all the variation, which is, which is exciting. Yeah. It's funny just to share one more little kind of tangent off of that, Charles, then we can officially kind of start. But uh, one of the many hats that I wear is actually in emergency and disaster management consulting. And it's kind of funny because something that I really try to drill through to people when I'm when I'm working with them, particularly like with companies, municipalities, organizations, farms, is that, you know, we put all of this work into creating plans and the planning process. But as somebody that has worked in emergency management for a while, I know that plan is not actually going to work. <laughs> it's not going to play out. And we're not actually making the plan, even thinking it's going to work out. It's actually the process of planning that gets us ready to be able to have the tool set, the skills, the adaptability to actually function in that time. So, you know, that's just kind of a neat thing to, to think about today. And um, I guess one thing I'd like to share, you know, with our, our theme tonight, earth repair, fungi and disasters, and then this idea of learning from nature. Uh, nature is such a beautiful model for, you know, being able to adapt in this, this, you know, chaos, you could call it, this beautiful, perfect chaos. Uh, you know, deer living outside, they don't know what's around the next corner. They don't know where the next meal is coming from. They don't know what the acorn drop is going to be like this year. They don't know if there's a wolf around there. And yet they just walk so gracefully in this, in this world, you know? So there's so much, you know, when I think about disaster preparedness that I feel like we can learn from observing the natural world, uh, taking that into our being and then applying that when we start to feel kind of the, the chaoticness of, of those different situations around us. So, um, you know, it, it is actually kind of neat that we started off tonight's conversation with this, so. But I'll pass it over to you, Charles. I don't want to. I don't want to ramble. Let's let's dive into it. Uh, well, first, I just want to say welcome to everybody, um, and um, just acknowledge that I'm joining joining this call and uh, from the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, Mi'kma'ki here in Nova Scotia, um, and we all stand on land that has been tended uh, by by peoples. Um, and maybe we are the indigenous people of the land. Maybe we are settlers coming to somebody else's land. Maybe uh, the people who have tended the land have been a mix of 
um, the indigenous stewards that have uh, been there from time immemorial to um, other settler people who've come either by choice, uh, willingly or unwillingly, um, as many uh, people have moved across the planet um, for lots of reasons and lots of ways. So I just want to acknowledge that we all stand on a beautiful piece of nature somewhere on the planet that um, is inherently beautiful and amazing to itself and has been tended by lots of, lots of people. And just to honor all those, all the people who have come before and all the people who are on land right now, um, because we shared this earth together. So I just want to welcome that. And invite you all to take a moment and let's ground to start tonight. So just take a deep breath and, and let go of any of the day that you need to let go of to be here. So if you've had busyness or crazy things that happened today or exciting things, whatever it is that just is pulling your attention, you can pick it up later. Just like set it down for a moment so you can be here for the next hour. Take a deep breath. I just invite you to take a deep breath and feel yourself settle into your chair. Or maybe you're on the floor, or maybe you're standing. Just feel your, where you connect to the earth, whatever that is. Whatever is like holding you. And allow your, the energy of yourself just to sink as if you became uh, less physical and more spiritual. And just allow that that mist of yourself to like sink down as if gravity was just like drawing it in, like a big hug, just like pulling you in. And just feel your, your the particles of you connect with the particles of the, the earth below us and around us. And as the plants breathe, and as fog rises, let, let some of that earth energy just rise up because it, it rises up too. And just let it rise up, kind of waft through us. And you just feel our connection right here, right now. And maybe you can just take a moment and feel the connection to the, the, the stars, the sun, the moon, whatever's in the sky right now. Just feel some of that. Even if you're inside, the force of these things still touch us. We know that because the tides move with the moon and the sun, the warmth of the day permeates our walls and our ceilings. So it's like, let's put the energy of that space just like touch us for tonight. And with three deep breaths, I say, welcome. And again, my name is Charles Williams. I'm with Earth Activist Training. I do a lot of different pieces of the training, a lot of permaculture work. Um, some of the basic, like a PDC class we're running right now, some advanced classes like our regenerative land design class, um, infrastructure classes, other mentorship programs. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here with you all and here with Chris, who's uh, amazing in his mushroom and wilderness skills. Um, so I'm going to leave that with my introduction. I'm going to pass it over to Chris to introduce himself. Yeah, hey everybody. Um, yeah, so my name is Chris Gilmore and uh, I'm coming to you tonight from the ancient mountain ranges known as the Granite Shield. So I'm up in what's today known as Ontario, Canada. Um, and I live right on the edge of, some of you have heard of it, Algonquin Park. Um, you know, there's a bit of controversy around the name Algonquin Park uh, because this was the Anishinaabe Nation uh, used to spend time on this land or still do actually many, many live here today. Um, but for a ge geological reference, Algonquin Park, which used to be a giant mountain range. And today it's these beautiful rolling hills. And we actually used to live on the edge of an ancient lake, you know, after the last glace, glace, ice age. It's amazing to think, you know, a good chunk of Southern Ontario and all the way down to the States, New York, Buffalo, were all underwater. Um, and, you know, we literally would have been on that ancient beach that used to look over that water. That's where I, where I'm coming from today and where I'm living. So, um, yeah, I've been working with earth activist training in a few different ways for a number of years now. So my wife and I, uh, live up here in Ontario and we run a wild foods, uh, business. So where we go and forage from the landscape and we have a whole line of foods and drinks that we sell. Uh, we take people out on mushroom walks and ecology walks and help people connect with the land. 
And then I also have uh, my project, which is Chris Outdoors, um, which is, is basically just me being me. And I have a lot of different passions in life. You know, um, self-reliance has always been a passion of mine. You know, I've always questioned the how sustainable and reliable is the infrastructure of our modern world. And, you know, about 20 years ago, that sent me on a journey of wanting to know how to grow food and just how to do things on my own. And, and then to be able to teach others and do that in small communities in a way that's hopefully more sustainable, but also is more, um, um, yeah, being more self-reliant if the infrastructure around us is starts to come down. So that's been a passion of mine for a long time. And in my early 20s, I realized that, you know, you can't really do that sustainably or even well unless you put it into context to the ecology that you live in and the habitat that you live in. So I started off kind of chasing the physical skills of how do you garden? How do you cut wood? How do you build things? And then realize, you know, that only goes so far if you don't actually understand, you know, what are the birds saying? And what do the wildlife tracks mean? And how do these things interact with each other? And um, that led to a really deep journey into understanding fungi, you know, which kind of connects all of those organisms together. Arguably, you know, one of the most important cornerstone species of the entire planet. Uh, if the mushrooms disappeared, everything else would, or a lot of it would, you know, it, it's really phenomenal to think about that. Um, so that's, you know, in a nutshell, kind of what I'm all about. And I guess you could say that Chris Outdoors, what I do today is really kind of bridging those different worlds, you know, the self-reliance, nature connection, and the tools of modern day emergency and disaster preparedness. How do we kind of put those all together into a holistic skill set? Uh, in this beautiful chaos that we call the modern world, you know, uh, when we don't really know, like those deer, we don't know what's around the next corner. So how do we live in that and thrive in that and heal in that and help others in that and, and then do our best in that. So that's, that's a little bit about what I am in essence. You know what, I, Cheryl, sorry, before I pass it back, I do want to just share one other thing too. You, you started with that beautiful land acknowledgement, you know, talking about all the people that have come before that. And in the spirit of healing, I also just want to mention that, you know, part of earth, earth repair uh, is cultural pair as well. Uh, and, you know, as we acknowledge, you know, that these are the traditional territories and, and still today territories of many Indigenous peoples, I'm not from here. I'm from across the pond uh, over Scotland, Hungary, and England. Uh, and I've been learning a lot about my history, but as I think about what it means to be on this land, I also want to acknowledge that there's actually a lot of work to be done. And there's a lot more than just saying that, hey, I acknowledge that was there. It's like, what are the actual steps? What is the cultural pair, which is part of earth repair? Uh, so I just want to, I want to add to that, just the, the need for those two things to go side by side as well. Yeah. Well, I think you were going to lead us off talking about mushrooms. If you, if you're feeling still called to lead off about mushrooms a bit, and then we'll get into a little more around disaster stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to. Great. So where we're going to go tonight a little bit, you know, our, our conversation tonight was called earth repair, fungi and disasters. And there really is a relationship between them. And, you know, one of the things I think about when I think about fungi is this beautiful mycelial web. And it was really mind blowing to me when I realized that a mushroom was not the organism. Uh, and for those that ha haven't had the discovery yet, hopefully you're going to have one of those moments right now. I'm, I'm sure some of you already know this already. But we see these little mushrooms, you know, they pop out of the ground, they pop out of trees and they look really cool. And you're like, oh, wow, look at this cool little organism. You know, we can pick it and some of them we can eat and they, some of them, you know, you crack them open and they oxidize and turn blue right in front of your eyes. But what was mind blowing to me is that that mushroom was actually the fruiting body of a way larger organism. And, you know, a good analogy would be like a mushroom is actually more like an apple on a tree. You know, when we look at an apple tree, we don't say, oh, the apple is like the organism or the whole thing. The apple is the seed. It's the fruiting body that allows the apple tree to reproduce elsewhere. Well, a mushroom is the same thing. The mycelium is actually the larger organism. And they've now tracked uh, um, fields of mycelium that are literally as large as three football fields across. You know, the exact same organism, three football fields wide, all growing underground that you would never even see other than these tiny little mushrooms that pop up that I used to think was the whole organism in and of itself. And, you know, through modern research, and it's kind of funny, you know, I was, I have a, a friend of mine, an Indigenous friend of mine, Caleb Musgrave, and uh, we were joking around the other night um, about how, you know, there's been these big scientific breakthroughs in the last, you know, couple of decades around how mycelium is this phenomenal communicator between species. 
You know, this mycelium literally makes a web under the soil, but not only under the soil, you know, it literally grows up into the trees and into the grass and into the plants. We have fungi inside of our bodies. Fungi is growing on what looks like sterile surfaces. You know, it really is everywhere, the different species of fungi. And science has proven, you know, that fungi actually communicates information between organisms. It swaps DNA. It's a significant part of evolution. Um, and it's been celebrated like this big scientific breakthrough, you know? So in, in acknowledging, uh, you know, indigenous wisdom tonight, uh, I, we laugh with my friend Caleb because he's like, our people have known this for thousands of years and you guys are acting like this is some big new discovery. Like we could have told you this like long before you even got here. So uh, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge that as well, you know, that the deep wisdom in, in people that really just sit and listen and observe um, and how beautiful it is and how much we can learn from that. So as we think about mycelium and our topics tonight, earth repair and um, fungi and disasters, um, I think a good starting point is to kind of understand a little bit more about the, the life cycle of fungi and the roles that they have in ecosystems. And did you make me, okay, I can, great. Yeah. I'm gonna actually share a slide here for a moment. Um, so we're gonna start off and talk a little bit about the role of fungi in nature. Um, and really this is just like scratching the surface of what, what these amazing organisms actually do. But you could, there's lots of different ways to group organisms, but three really important groups in the fungi realm are, are three different ways that we could group mushrooms are to look at their ecological roles. So three different groups are saprophytic mushrooms, mycorrhizae mushrooms, and parasitic mushrooms. And I wanna chat a little bit about each of these ones right now. So. Saprophytic mushrooms are the decomposers of the world. And a lot of the common mushrooms that we eat from the grocery store, like probably 90% of them, maybe even 95% of them are saprophytic mushrooms. Um, a lot of the ones that we ID in the wild, the majority of the ones that we grow commercially are saprophytic mushrooms. And they play such an important role in the ecosystem because they're the ones that actually break down complex um, carbons and complex chemicals into simpler components that then allow other organisms, microbes, enzymes to come in and digest them and transform them into other usable uh, ingredients for, for the web of life. Um, so trees, you know, probably, I don't know if, if I can say this 100%, but like trees, like probably wouldn't break down, at least they wouldn't break down very quick if it wasn't for saprophytic mushrooms. They're huge in basically taking, going into like carbon and you have your cellulose and you have your linen and they basically take these pretty complex kind of chemicals within the tree and they break them down into these simpler forms, which then allow all the other bacteria, microbes to get in there, uh, which then turns that tree into soil and recycles uh, the life. So just understanding that saprophytic role, basically breaking down matter is really important in understanding just how important that is in the earth's ecosystem. The next one we want to chat about is mycorrhizae. And mycorrhizae are ones that have symbiotic relationships. Mycorrhizae funguses grow in the soil. So a saprophytic, like an oyster mushroom, would be a popular saprophytic mushroom. Reishi mushroom, um, chaga mushroom, these are all saprophytic mushrooms. Sorry. Um, yeah, a lot of the common ones we think about uh, breaking things down. Mycorrhizae actually, instead of growing in wood or on carbon, they actually grow in the soil. Uh, and these are the ones that create these really amazing uh, relationships between species. So I'm going to pose a quick little question. Maybe you can throw this in the chat right now. Uh, but I'm going to name three types of plants. So horsetails, ferns, and club mosses. Does anyone know what they have in common? I'm going to switch over. Horsetails, ferns, and uh, club mosses. What do they have in common? Throw it in the chat if you have an idea. Yeah, Tia threw it in there. Spores, spores, spores. So all three of those plants actually reproduce through spores, which is kind of fascinating because mushrooms reproduce through spores. And, you know, depending on what your kind of spiritual belief is, uh, and if you accept some degree of evolution uh, as being, you know, part of how, how life has come to be, uh, at one time it's, it's thought that there was only spore producing plants. And actually, let's even go back before that. So at one time, we basically had single cell organisms that laid flat on the earth's floor, and they had no way of transferring nutrients uh, between each other. And every single part of that organism had to photosynthesize and eat and basically contain the whole thing. 
Um, and then they would spread out cell by cell across the Earth's floor. The very first plants that actually were able to start climbing up towards the sun and photosynthesizing better, creating a more complex organism, actually formed a symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizae fungi. And it was the fungi, because they didn't actually have vascular systems, it was the fungi that actually carried the nutrients up in the stem, allowing this to now, this organism to now reach up towards the sun, photosynthesize better, and send roots out under the soil, stretching out to get more water, more nutrients, and grow. So interesting enough, the very first plants, horsetails, uh, club moss, and ferns were actually spore-producing plants. And then over time, those evolved into the more complex organisms we know today, basically into like the genosperms, which are our conifer trees, like our pine trees and our cedars. And then even more complex than that are deciduous trees, which came way, way later in kind of evolutionary history. Um, so mycorrhizae basically is like the transfer of information uh, across the landscape. And then the last one on here is parasitic mushrooms. And, you know, I want to start this one by saying, let's not think about parasitic from our kind of anthropocentric Western word lens. Because often we think of parasitic as a negative thing uh, in our modern terms. You know, I think about the parasite that I get in my stomach that makes me sick. Um, but recognize that, you know, if we're not thinking about solely preserving human life, that parasites are not necessarily good or bad uh, and can actually have really, really important roles. So parasitic mushrooms are basically mushrooms that infect a host um, and change that host for itself to live. And probably one of the more famous ones that some of you may know in the mushroom realm is cordyceps mushrooms that actually basically parasitize an insect um, and able to grow. And cordyceps create phenomenal uh, medicine. When I had COVID a couple of months back and, and was quite sick, um, I was working with cordyceps and reishi to basically restore my nervous system um, and my cognitive function afterwards. And I felt like it made a phenomenal difference working with those couple of mushrooms. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second here. And let's chat a little bit. Now that we understand those different roles, we're going to zoom in on the saprophytic mushrooms a little bit though. Because when it comes to earth repair specifically, as well as preparedness for climate change, preparedness for disasters, when we look at the role of a saprophytic mushroom in the natural world, uh, all kinds of possibilities emerge on how we can actually grow our relationship with this species and, and utilize some of those gifts in, in our lives. So as I already mentioned, saprophytic mushrooms um, are one of the easier types of mushrooms to actually reproduce. And most of our edible mushrooms are made out of saprophytic mushrooms. And for myself, you know, I've had a dream since I was a young child, myself and my wild, of wanting to like live off the land, you know. Uh, I'd imagine a few people here can kind of relate to that journey. I don't even really know where it came from, but pretty young in life, I was like, oh, I want to live out in the woods and I want to grow food and live off the land. I don't even think I knew what that meant. And uh, it's, it's, it's harder said than done, especially in this modern world where we have jobs and other responsibilities. Um, so it's been a long journey, you know. I've been consciously working on it for 20 years now. And I would say out of all the things, so I live on a little homestead now, we've got, you know, 26 acres, uh, we got a little kind of half acre garden, and we have chickens and rabbits, and we've been doing some food forest uh, stuff for the last 10 years. So we're, we're growing a fair bit of food, but it's been a lot of work to get there. And, you know, there's not many things that we're totally self sufficient in, meaning that we have completely closed the cycle. So we don't need anything from the outside world to reproduce it. And that we actually produce enough of it to um, to live off of year round. The first thing that we were able to do that from, and it literally just like propelled our preparedness forward was being able to grow and forage mushrooms. I'm blown away by how much you can grow in such a small space and how little work it is compared to the majority of annual crops I grow in my garden. I have mushroom logs right now that I inoculated eight years ago and they're still producing fruit eight years later with no annual tending other than harvesting. So inoculated them once. And then, you know, there is a bit of work that first year to inoculate them, but eight years later, they're still producing upwards of three quarters of a pound per year of mushrooms. Um, and on top of that, you know, mushrooms, it's kind of funny. I don't know if anyone else ever had this myth for some reason, and maybe it comes from like the white button mushrooms in the store, but for some reason growing up, I always thought that mushrooms were just kind of like filler you know, in your, in your food and didn't, you know, like they look, they're, they're white, like I can't have much nutrient value in them. Uh, little did I know 
uh, you know, that you could argue they're one of the most potent foods that we have access to. And that's why everything in the forest eats them. Squirrels eat mushrooms, deer eat mushrooms, wolves yeah. eat mushrooms, bears eat mushrooms, uh, for a very good reason. Birds eat mushrooms. Um, they are chock full of protein. So mushrooms are very high in protein. They're high in vitamins, particularly vitamin D, vitamin A. And obviously this is going to change from one species to the next. They're high in minerals. And of course, all of this research starting to come out now into their medicinal properties, whether it's using reishi as a nervine or an adaptogen, um, or myself using it for nerve and cognitive function coming out of COVID or respiratory issues, um, the, the anti-cancer properties that we're starting to see in all of these mushrooms uh, are starting to scientifically prove. Uh, again, I think there's people that have known that for a long time. Um, it's, it's phenomenal, the resource that they play. But the other part that I want to add to this, so one, you know, growing mushrooms and then learning to forage them sustainably allowed us to suddenly have this crop that in a very small space, we actually grow more than a year's worth for my wife and I. And on top of that, we give a ton of them away. So we grow more mushrooms than we can eat in a year. It's the only crop that we produce more of than we can eat in a year. It's a, literally like two days of work a year for us, maybe, maybe a little bit more than that because it's kind of spread it out, but it's incredibly low work for that whole year of food. And on top of that, the mushrooms allow us to build our soil, feed our animals, and perform all of these other roles within uh, the farm ecosystem. So our soil has started improving substantially since we got mushrooms. In the winter time, we put the mycelium into our worm composter and it speeds up the rate at which the worms uh, break down the food and makes the worms even healthier and then makes the excrement coming out of the worms healthier. So we're basically making supercharged compost. So when spring comes around and we're starting to do our starts, we're literally taking worm castings with worms that have been feeding off of mycelium and then we're putting it into our plant starts to grow our vegetables for the year. So they are adding to the soil on the land. They're healing the soil that's damaged um, they are healing our own bodies and we're growing a year's worth in an incredibly small space with a pretty low amount of work. And then the last place I'll put on that, you know, most of the things we grow on our farm, we're reliant on external things where we have to go out and like, you know, buy seeds or buy plants or buy soil nutrients. Um, with the fungi, we're able to actually now take certain strains, particularly aggressive ones with oysters, where we can actually take small amounts of it and then regrow it out on new substrate, get it healthy again, and then spread it again. So once you get it going, it's almost like a, a sourdough starter or a kombucha starter, where you're actually able to use it over and over again once you understand the life cycle, what it needs at the different stages of its life cycle. Uh, so they're, they're just a phenomenal organism to think about. So uh, I'm going to pass it back to Charles in a couple of minutes here, because I know we don't have a super long time tonight. But we just chatted about it from a, a preparedness perspective, or I shouldn't even say preparedness. I, I, I want to weave this into the preparedness and the earth repair part before I pass it back to Charles. So one aspect of preparedness is thinking about self-reliance, right? Um, you know, if food becomes more expensive, if the grocery store is shut down for a small period of time, for whatever reason, uh, when disaster strikes, do I have enough food in my pantry to get by for a little while? I would argue that, you know, mushrooms are one of the top crops on our list for actual just production quality, for the quality of nutrient that we can produce in quantity. Uh, and I think I've, I've made the case for that. But beyond that, how they relate to preparedness. So one, you know, you could, you could make the argument from a prevention perspective, if we're able to produce more food locally, we're actually not contributing to some of the problems of climate change to begin with. But they also now have this ability to start healing damaged landscapes. And whether this is healing a landscape before a disaster happens to hopefully prevent the disaster from being worse, or whether the disasters actually come through and strike, and now we're actually working with the mycelium nation to actually go in and heal and restore that ecosystem back to health again faster, they can play this amazing role in earth repair and disaster response. So I'm going to share a couple quick, um, sorry, I'm seeing a bunch of questions pop up there. Maybe, maybe Charles, you can feed a couple of those to me, like at the end, if we have some time, um, if you're just kind of taking notes or we'll do a little Q and A at the end there. But, um, so back to disasters though, um, mushrooms play, or disasters and earth repair. So knowing that mushrooms play, have this role as saprophytes and they break down matter, what's phenomenal, the same way that they can break down cellulose and the ligand in trees, 
they can also do that with complex chemicals. So all of this research is starting to go into what we call microremediation, where you can now take mushrooms and you can infuse them into soil that has oil in it or gasoline in it or uh, PCBs in it. Um, all these different chemicals inside of the soil. And the same way that the mushroom goes into the wood and basically takes these more complex chemicals and breaks them down to their simplest form. So then the other things can get in there and it decays. Mushrooms also have the ability to break down a number of complex chemicals. They also have the ability to accumulate heavy metals. Now this is not all mushrooms equally. These are certain species, uh, some better than others have the ability to uh, pull toxins out of the landscape. So there's a number of mushrooms that will pull lead out of water or out of soil that will pull mercury. And what's interesting enough, that lead can actually be then recycled out of the mushroom and turned back into something else if we need to. Um, and then on top of that, you know, you take a damaged soil site. Um, and this is, you know, I'm going to share one little piece here around ecology. You know, I, I shared about how I realized if I wanted to get into preparedness, farming, um, environmentalism, I needed to understand ecology because um, how do they work? If we start thinking about the roles of plants and ecosystems, right? Around here, if you get really, really compressed soil and think about this, around where you live, places that are humans have compacted it. So whether it's an old construction site, the side of a road, what are the first plants that you see start to grow in those ecosystems? If you want to think about earth repair, learn and build a relationship with the first plants that start to grow in a damaged ecosystem. So the ones that come to mind for me here are mullein and burdock and yellow dock. Interesting enough, a lot of these plants are what we call biennial plants. They have a two-year life cycle. They have a big tap root that goes down into the ground. They can grow in nutrient poor environments. And by sending this big tap root into the ground, they actually take that compressed soil and they start to break it up. And then it dies in two years. So that tap uh, root basically now goes soft and it creates a channel for water to get in. It creates a channel for insects to get in. It creates a channel for microbes. It creates a channel for rodents to start getting in there and it starts loosening up the soil. And as they're doing it, they're now consuming the root of this thing. And of course they have waste or food in, waste goes out. So their excrement stays in that hole and now they're actually building the soil quality. So that's what's happening underneath the ground. But on top of the ground, Mullen plants, uh, if any of you know them, the big tall ones with these big, beautiful, fuzzy green leaves and the beautiful yellow flowers. Yellow flowers, you can make ear oil out of it for ear infections. Uh, the fuzzy leaves are phenomenal for respiratory infections. But every year they lay down these big, beautiful green leaves on the ground that die back. And they do that for two years, let their seeds go, and then they move on. So not only are they preparing the soil underneath the ground, they're also laying these leaves down on top of the ground, which is now starting to build that soil and heal it back. There's the ultimate teachers in how do you restore damaged landscapes right there, the mullen plants. Certain mushrooms, you'll notice doing the same thing. So pay attention to where the mushrooms are actually growing. What is their role in that ecosystem? And what we've been noticing, uh, particularly species, um, there's this gravel pit that we often go and hike on with our dog in the evening. And uh, it's full of bolete species, super nutrient poor, um, compacted soil, boletes, B-O-L-E-T-E-S, boletes. And there's just boletes growing all through this place there. And, you know, I'm relatively new in building my relationship with boletes. Um, but uh, I already have an idea that, you know, they have some sort of relationship with the mullen and the burdock that's growing there. And this role of spreading that mycelium through all of this compacted soil and transferring nutrients around, transferring water around, loosening up the soil as that mycelium actually dies uh, it's going to be consumed by insects it's going to be consumed by microbes which are going to then now have their excrement that's left there and actually building the soil quality there so they have this phenomenal ability to go in and heal damage ecosystems and that's relevant as a prevention tool for disasters because you know there's so many disasters that are happening today when we go back and look at it we're like wow this is actually poor human design you know when we look at hurricane harvey Hurricane Harvey was horrific. And, you know, regardless of climate change, that hurricane might have happened. But if you look at, you know, Texas 50 years ago was full of wetlands. And now it's full of paved over creeks and sidewalks and buildings. And I would wager a lot of money that if you went back 50 years ago 
and Hurricane Harvey hit Texas, it would not have been nearly as damaging. And I'm not saying it wouldn't have still been bad. I'm not saying people might have still died. I'm saying it would not nearly have been the scale it was if we had those natural wetlands and natural ecosystems in place. Uh, when we restore natural places back and we use better design working with nature, it actually mitigates the impact of these disasters on our landscape in the first place. Um, so by working with mycelium, we can heal landscapes to a more natural state. So then you actually have the buffer when these bigger storm systems come through. Um, and then on top of that, after the storm, and this is the last part I want to end with here, is after the storm comes through, we now have the properties that we talked about where mushrooms can actually pull toxins out of the landscape, right? And there's, this part is, I'm not at all pretending to be an expert. We had hoped to have Lila Darwish on us with us tonight. Lila is going to be doing, sorry, Charles, what's the name of the class that Lila's running? Can you just type uh, it? That really bioremediation quick? and earth repair. I'll put it in the chat. Yeah. Um, so Lila's going to be running this course called bioremediation and earth repair. I mean, I've, I've been studying this stuff for quite a while. I, you know, I mess around with it a lot, but I'm not nearly the expert that Lila is on this component. My, my part is the growing part, the foraging part, the building relationship with part, and how do we use it in disaster preparedness from a planning. Lila is like a scientist when it comes to bioremediation and working with mushrooms. And she I was involved. I think she was involved with this project. I, th I first heard about it through you, Charles where they're working out in California. So imagine you have a big wildfire burns through an area yeah. and all of the trees are burned down, you have buildings burned down, all of this stuff. And you know, the, the burnt ashes from the tree when left in place in the soil, there is an argument that that's, you know, could be said to be it's neutral. Maybe you can even argue it's beneficial to some degree uh, in rebuilding soil. But what happens when you have that over massive landscapes and then you have drought. So the water, the land is so dry, it no longer absorbs water and then put too much pavement on there on top of that, you get a big rain. Suddenly all of that suit is washing down hills and it's going into the river. And we're seeing massive problems with fish populations and other organisms crashing in these ecosystems after these big fires because of everything that washes into the water, both natural and human-made, right? So this organization out on the West Coast, and maybe you remember the name of them, uh, Charles, I can't remember off the top of my head, but they, uh, they're a not-for-profit and they're basically taking burlap uh, I think it's burlap and they're filling it with straw and they're inoculating with oyster mushrooms. And you can think about, uh, you know, when we have floods and you take the sandbags and you build the flood walls to stop the floods from passing through there. Uh, they're basically doing the same, the equivalent of that, but they're doing it with straw inoculated with oyster mycelium. And now what happens is when you get this runoff with all the suit and the chemicals, it hits the straw wall and it has to filter through the straw wall. And as that water's coming through the straw wall, the oyster mycelium is now taking those chemicals and it's actually breaking them down into simpler forms that are less toxic when they make it to the waterway. Um, so there's actually all of these new things happening where we're starting to use mushrooms in response to disasters, response to oil spills, uh, response to other toxic leaching out on the landscape. So, you know, I could keep talking about this all night and uh, I, I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but. Um, should I mention the, the mushroom growing now, Charles, or should I yeah, come back? This, to is, this is a good time to mention it. Okay, I'll, I'll yeah. do that now, and then I'll pass it over to you for a little yeah. bit. So when you're thinking about mushrooms, you know, I would say the starting point, if this, if this interests you, whether it's the remediation part, whether it's the growing the year's worth of food part, whether it's just wanting to build a deeper relationship with this fascinating organism, uh, maybe it's for health reasons, maybe it's for esoteric reasons, I would suggest that, you know, the starting point is building your relationship with ecology and the natural world, you know, going out and just observing, where do you find them in the natural world? We're always trying on, we, so Laura and I run these mushroom walks. They sell out super fast. We'll have, you know, 20 to 30 people showing up and everyone shows up with baskets and they're like, what can I eat? What can I put in my mouth? And our goal is to be like, hey, slow down. Before you ask, what can you put in your mouth? Maybe you want to ask like, where does this grow? And why does it grow there? What other role does it have in the ecosystem? What else eats this organism? You know, I've heard people make the argument in the foraging world that, oh, it's okay to harvest all of a mushroom in a spot because they'll come back the next year. You know, you, if you do that to wild leeks, you'll kill them. You know, you can't go and take all the wild leeks because the next year they won't come back. I can go into my reishi forest, the hemlock forest, and I can harvest every single reishi and the reishi will be back next year. And I've actually heard people make the argument, so it's okay to take all the reishi. But what else eats reishi? on the landscape, right? What other role do they have that we don't even understand as modern humans yet? 
I, I know there's probably more we don't understand than we do about their role in the ecosystem. Uh, so when we, people show up on these mushroom foraging walks, we say, hey, you know, before you think about consuming it or even working with it, let's just slow down and observe it. Let's really feel, you know, where, where is it growing? Why is it growing there? What is it doing? What is it interacting with? And that's a lifelong journey. And, and to me, it's more rewarding than throwing something in my mouth or throwing something in a frying pan. Uh, now, when you get to the point where you feel confident that you can actually pick it and put it in the frying pan, it's phenomenal. I, I love eating mushrooms. It's so beautiful. And we absolutely can learn to forage in a sustainable way. But uh, if we don't build the relationship first through observation, and I think back to permaculture, you know, which is earth activist training, kind of their, one of their staples there, you know, one of the first principles of poor permaculture is observe before interacting, right? Um, so I'm going to say, if you want to start building a relationship, the starting point is to observe. Uh, observe them in the natural world and start thinking about the role they play. From there, starting to grow them and starting to learn them by their families is really helpful. Um, so... Yeah, they're a great organism. Uh, you can grow them outdoors and you can grow them indoors. You could grow a significant amount of mushrooms in an urban apartment. Like that's one of the amazing things. I grow them in the wintertime in five gallon buckets. You can grow them, if you drink a lot of coffee, you can grow them in your coffee grounds right beside your sink, right? There's so many different ways you can grow them inside. And if you have a little bit more space, we can grow them in our garden beds. Even if you just have like a small container garden in a backyard in the city. Uh, I wish I had a picture of it, but we grow wine caps underneath our squash and our pumpkins. So you literally have squash and pumpkins and the, they create the shade that the wine crops grow up in underneath. And they're building the soil to give us healthier squashes. And we put down uh, mulch and they're helping break down that mulch. So they're actually part of building the soil healthier as we're growing pieces in them. So starting to grow them is a phenomenal next step. And then from there, uh, starting to learn to actually ID them in the wild. And I would recommend when I first started trying to learn mushrooms, I started trying to learn them one at a time. And there's too many of them and they look too similar. So start by learning the parts of a mushroom and start by learning the families of mushrooms. There's bolete mushrooms um, that have pores. There's guild mushrooms. There's um, coral mushrooms, right? There's conch mushrooms that grow on trees. So if you start with the basic groups instead of the individuals and figure out what's similar about those groups, how do they act in nature? What are the parts of those groups? It's really going to speed up your learning curve on, on starting to build that relationship and getting yourself to the point that you might actually be comfortable harvesting them to eat, uh, knowing that you're safe. And you do really have to be careful with mushrooms. There are more toxic and poisonous mushrooms around here than there are plants. Um, and some of them that will kill you. Um, so it is, it is something you really got to know your stuff with. Um, so I'm going to leave it there for right now as, as the journey point there. What I did want to share with the group, though, if anybody would like to have a mentor and support in this, my wife, Laura, and I have been taking what we've learned over the last 20 years of doing this, and we've turned it into a course that we simply just called The Mushroom Course. Um, so our mushroom course is designed to help you grow an abundance of food in a small space, even if you live in the city. Uh, it's designed to help you save quite a bit of money because <laughs> mushrooms are super expensive in the grocery store. Um, and you can literally buy one bag of spawn and you can just keep growing indefinitely. So you can buy a bag of spawn for 30 bucks or a mushroom grow kit, and it'll give you like kind of two or three flushes of mushrooms, which is great. But what we teach you to do in the course is take that $30 thing of spawn and now actually spread it into more bags, spread it into straw, spread it into coffee. And suddenly, instead of growing, you know, $30 of mushrooms, you're growing thousands of dollars of mushrooms. And suddenly you have a year supply that you're growing. So we teach people how to grow indoors and out multiple different species, multiple different techniques. And then we also have a bunch of lessons on mushroom ecology. So what are the roles in ecosystems? Um, and we've, I've been following my wife along as she does her mushroom walk over the last year. Cause what we find all the time, people will come on our mushroom walks and then they're like, Oh, they came with their basket and like, I can't wait. I want to know what I eat. And they leave being like, Oh my goodness, there's so much to learn. And I can't even remember the first five mushrooms we talked about. So I basically filmed her breaking down each one of these mushrooms and talking about the ecology, talking about the parts, talking about the relationships with other pieces and talking about the edible properties, cooking and stuff like that. So we have our virtual mushroom walk, which is all these recorded videos with my wife. Um, we have the ecology lessons. Uh, we have this fun thing called the virtual, or sorry, the, the mushroom scavenger hunt where we teach you the eight main groups and then give you a printout so you can actually go out and start to learn the groups. And then we ha have all the lessons on growing species indoors and out. So if anyone is interested in joining my wife, Laura, in this course, it, it's running continuously online. Um, and you can go to themushroomcourse.com. And we have a, a special discount for the crew tonight. If you enter WILD30, 
uh, it'll give you $30 off. So just let me put that in the chat quick. Oh, am I just putting that right? I think that's right. So themushroomcourse.com and then wild30 as the coupon code will get you $30 off. And for anyone tuning in from the US tonight, which I think is a lot of you, I looked at the exchange rate today and it's crazy, uh, but it's like almost like 35% right now or something stupid yeah. like that. So if you're, if the course is priced in Canadian dollars, so if you're from the US, you basically get like another like $30 off of the course, or sorry, another 30% off of the course with the exchange rate uh, put in. So uh, $30 off of the coupon, 30% with the exchange rate, mushroomcourse.com, wild30. Uh, we'd love to have you come along on this journey with us if you're interested. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Maybe there'll be a bit of time for Q and A at the end, but I, I've talked a lot, Charles. I, I, sorry if I took up more time than I was supposed to, I'll, I'll pass it no back worries. to you. You know me when I get going. So <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, there's so much excitement, um, so much out there. Um, so yeah. Um, if you want to know any more about the growing in mushrooms, Chris has this great course. If you want to know more about the remediation, how to use mushrooms, um, and plants and, um, um, Bacteria for remediation, uh, Lila Darwish's remediation course, which is coming right up, uh, uh, starting October 12th. So there's still a little few spots left. So if you're at all interested in learning about how to do remediation um, with um, cleaning up toxic soils. Um, Laura and I hope to take one of those spots with Lila. I'm, I'm pretty yeah. happy about that one myself. She's, yeah. she's like a ridiculous wealth of knowledge of that, that kind of science side of it yeah. and the disaster application of it. Yeah, and she's been doing it, which is great. You know, she comes with a very, very practical um, um, approach. And then if you're interested more about the general disaster kind of design, Chris is going to be doing that starting in, uh, next year in February, I believe. Uh, no, January. So that course will be starting then. Um, so if you're interested in going deeper in any of those. But one, what I wanted to touch on tonight, and I have a short amount of time, so I'll just kind of abbreviate it down, is I just have a few questions to ask and uh, pose you. Think about where you are and what are the likely disasters that you face where you're at right now? You can put them in the chat or you can just say them to yourself. You can say them out loud. Um, uh, but just take a moment. What are the, what are the major disasters that you're, you're facing like, when it comes down to it? You know, I live here in uh, Nova Scotia, New Maggi, and, you know, we just had Fiona come ripping through. And there's every year there's more storms coming through. We've got floods, we've got sea level rise, we've got some fires are starting to become more common that weren't historically. But what it is that you're facing? What are the, the, the disasters that are, are facing you? Um, fire, tsunami, um, sea level rise, of course, and earthquakes. So as you think about this, like, thank you. I'm not sure who said that, the voice from out and about, thank you. And there's some great stuff in the chat. So I'm gonna repose this question. It's like, if you were a songbird, what are the common disasters where you are? If you were a spruce tree or a deciduous tree, if you were a salamander, what are the common disasters you'd face? And are they different? Always fire. Oh. Lack of food, lack of quality water. Ah. Still earthquake. Road building, cars. Yeah, habitat loss. Nice. We're starting to get to what my point is. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that kind of moving in this way, like, um, you can see I it think everywhere. So, there's so less insects, less insects all the time. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if you're talking about something that's an insect or something that eats insects, yeah. Um, you know, or something where the nutrient cycle, because new, the insects are an important part of the nutrient cycle, right? They, they bring a huge amount of really particular nutrients to the forest ecosystem. Uh, because they live on plants, they die, and their like their exoskeletons go and decompose. Well, we can get into ecology. Really, insects have a lot to do. But oftentimes, when we think about disasters, they're part flood, of the food chain. Fire, you know, you know, whatever you're, you're thinking about these things. But is the flood the disaster? Like, think about what's the hardship, what it causes. Often, it isn't the flood or the fire. It's the destruction of critical infrastructure. 
Like the problem is I can't eat. <laughs> the problem is I can't get a hold of my loved ones. Um, the cause is a fire or a flood or sea level rise or earthquake has destroyed part of our system. We have a system that supports our life, especially as humans. We have this kind of integral system, these kind of complex roadways. You're like, where's my food come from? Like, rarely do we say it all comes from just like right here. Like, some people may have designed a life where you have like really local, like a really sustainable local uh, resilient food system, but a lot of people don't. Your food comes from all over the place and it comes through very close, you know, unique channels we call roads. And when those roads get knocked out, when those power lines go down, we, we are in a state of disaster, right? Um, the disaster may not be the flood. Like historically speaking, you know, Chris was talking about like, what would it look like? We looked at, um, we looked historically before we had a lot of like land pavement and destruction, you know, what would it look like for disasters? And they're different, right? You know, a flood isn't naturally a disaster. The, the natural cycle, when you think of a natural cycle and, you know, it's nice that it kind of aligns with my spiritual tradition where you're like, oh, you know, there, there's a cycle where it's, you know, birth, growth, life, death, decay, regeneration. Like this is a cycle and it is important. And, you know, floods used to be the way in which nutrients were regenerated into the landscape, you know, the floodplains, like it was a way in which nutrients got brought back into the landscape. It was important. Fires were a regenerative force, you know, you needed death and decay okay. for regeneration to come. Like we needed that. However, we live in a system right now that's not so much the case because there's like the natural cycle. And then there's the point where we say, no, no, we've stopped it. We've made our levees. We've, you know, Smokey the Bear it so that, that we have huge fuel loads. And now we get catastrophic events and climate changes are creating what would be natural cycles are now becoming catastrophic um, events, events that are beyond the scope of what our ecological systems are used to, right? So our social systems, you're like, oh, we know we plant our road systems and all our culverts are like this big and now our storms are this big and our culverts aren't big enough. Uh, so we have systems that aren't scaled to the disturbance. And it's not that disturbance is bad. It's that disturbance that our, our infrastructure, our systems that we've designed don't match our disturbance. Um, so what I, I challenge us in, in the permaculture approach where you say, oh, you know, we talk about, um, something like redundancy. Like, how do we have a redundancy in our system to make it resilient? And what I mean by redundancy is how do I get a critical need I have in more than one way? So it's like, oh, I need food. If the only way I get food is from like the grocery, the box grocery store, if that's the only way and that grocery store shuts down, I don't have food anymore. Like, that's a problem. So if I can be like, oh, I get some food from this grocery store and I have a farmer's market and I've got a garden and I got a friend over here who farms and like, oh, now I have redundancy. I have a lot of different sources, right? Um, so how do I get um, other critical things I need? Um, you know, electricity, is electricity critical to us? Maybe you might say so, but I would say that electricity allows us to do critical things. Electricity allows us to eat. It allows us to maybe do work that gets us paid because we use that link. Like, there's complex systems. It allows us to do a lot of things, you know, to see at night. Um, you know, is it critical for our survival? Well, yeah, because it allows us to do all these things. It allows us to con contact loved ones, which is important, like our emotional well-being, right? So how do we get our energy? Like, well, if you say, oh, I have a coal fire power plant and, and it comes through these lines and it comes in this particular way and it gets to me, it's super, like, um, uh, um, problematic because at any point along the way you can lose it. The power plant could stop. You could have a break in a line here. You could have a break in a line there. And then, you, you know, one tree comes down and you can have people out. There's people not far from me that have had no power for 11 days. And that's a critical system of power grid that is designed uh, with centralized power. It's a centralized power system. And that says that you have power in one place and you distribute that to everybody else, but there's lots of places along that you can have it break down. Um, it reflects our social system too. We have a, a social power system, you know, where there's a hierarchy of power and it's centralized. Um, and I think part of what we are talking about is how do we decentralize some of our systems? How do we look at disasters as not um, these events that happen to us, but they're events that happen to the systems that we've created um, 
And our, if our systems can't handle it, we may want to reconsider our systems. So right now, rebuilding is happening up here. We're rebuilding. Like people are madly putting the power lines back up right where they were in the same way they were set up in the same situation. And next year, there's going to be another storm. Um, so the question is, if we live within cycles and systems, if we think about a system that we live in, like how does our infrastructure, how does our, our critical systems um, reflect both a redundancy, so we have many ways to get that, how do they reflect the understanding that we live in cycles? So that um, there's this birth, you know, in our, in our electrical grid, there's a birth of it, it happened, you know, there's growth, it got bigger, it's gonna grow some more. The, for um, staying in below a you know, two degrees rising in carbon in, in North America, we have to about double our grid. Like the grid has to double in size and our electrical generation has to become um, uh, green electrical generation from um, coal-based and fossil fuel-based. So our grid's growing, like we're growing. But if that system follows the natural system, birth, growth, at some point, parts of it dies. And then there needs to be regeneration. The question is, how does that regeneration look different than what was before, if before isn't working anymore? So this is for urban, this is for rural, this is a question about systems. So we're gonna, there, this is something that's gonna be talked more about in lots of our classes and I'm running out of time, so I can't delve into like, then what? So I'm gonna leave the cliffhanger. The cliffhanger for everybody is like, and then what do we do? When we have these systems that are, are centralized power systems, um, whether they're social power systems or grid power systems or food systems that have centralized distribution systems. And how do we shift those to becoming ones that understand the ecological system, which is this idea that we work in cycles and that those cycles support the growth of the whole. Like death is not a bad thing. You know, parasitic mushrooms aren't necessarily bad. They are part of a larger system and we need to understand that system. You know, um, a flood is not a bad thing if we're ready for it because we've designed well versus if we've created a system that was designed for there being no floods um, or with very little thought about that. Um, so we need to reapproach how we, we think about the design and disaster in response. Uh, but I'm out of time, so I can't answer any of the questions, but I'm just gonna say, come to Chris's class, come to Lila's class, come to some of the Earth Activist training class. I do one on infrastructure in particular, and we can talk more about it there. Um, yeah, come to our social permaculture ones and talk about how do we do it within a social context, not just a, not just a like nuts and bolts on the ground, but how do we do it in our social relationships and social design organizationally. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave it with that. <laughs> I would love to, I know we're running over here, Charles, but I would love to just share one quick concept there. I, th I threw a word in there and uh, there's this guy I met a number of years, Bob Stilger, a fascinating gentleman. He spent a lot of time over in Japan uh, prior to Fukushima and then supporting them afterwards. He does a lot of amazing work through his organization's news stories on the West Coast. And, you know, we were reflecting um, on the role of disasters and regeneration. And he uh, brought up this term that I thought was fascinating. He said, you know, we have these things called first responders in our modern world. And first responders are essential, you know. Uh, when somebody breaks their leg or gets in a car accident, you need a first responder to come in there and save their life. But there's this interesting, interesting psychological thing that happens that even when our systems don't serve us, when they get thrown into disarray, we tend to want to cling on to what we had before because it's what we know and what is comfortable. And what we, Charles just referenced there is, you know, how many of these, like, who goes nuts? Like when we look at these hurricanes in Florida and the infrastructure and we're like, this isn't new. Hurricane, like the hurricanes are getting worse, but they've been happening for a long time. And every time we just build back the same way that we did before, maybe a little bit stronger, right? Uh, and there's this natural psychological impulse to cling on to what was there from before when things are throwing out a disarray. It's really hard, as a lot of us know, as environmental activists, to make change in our system because there's so much money and there's so much just commitment that's gone into the current infrastructure. So when we think about regeneration, the lesson of the mushrooms and the lessons of nature right now, when disasters come through, even though suffering happens in it, there's actually this brief window in time where we actually have the opportunity to say, hey, stop. We couldn't act, we've been trying to change this for 40 years and have gotten nowhere. And now it just fell apart overnight. We actually have a moment right now that we could actually rebuild this in a different way. And he termed, coined this term called regenerative responders. We need first responders that save lives in the disaster, but we need regenerative responders whose job 
is to basically look for those windows when nature takes down a system that's no longer serving us and can say, hey, pause before we build this back. Could we actually do things a little bit differently? So I just thought that was a really beautiful term um, to kind of think about and maybe end with tonight. And it, it's a big part, you know, as I mentioned, I started working in municipal emergency management and working with businesses and I loved it and learned a lot. But the reason I kind of went from there and started working with Earth Activist Training and Our Eco Village and organizations with that instead is this like, the number of emergency planners that have no understanding of nature and ecology and don't even know that, that, that there's importance in that is kind of mind boggling. And it's like, wow, how do we design systems? If our, if our planners don't understand ecology, of course they're fragile systems to begin with. Um, so a lot of the work that we're doing here with Earth Activist Training in these classes, and uh, Charles had referenced one that I'm gonna be teaching this winter and it's called, uh, what is it, Earth, Water, no, sorry. A fire, flood, drought, um... Uh, disaster community community resilience yeah fire flood drought and heat creating community resilience so we're going to be running a six-week course starting in the winter time and are basically we're going to be looking at how do we look at models in nature and then how do we bridge that knowledge of ecology with the best of modern day emergency planning so how do we create emergency plans for our business for our farm for our family for our organization for our municipality how do we actually create preparedness plans, strategies, responses, mitigation tools for climate change, but have it actually rooted in ecology. So if that is of interest in you, you might want to check out that course we have coming up this winter. Um, and then of course, the bioremediation course that Lila's running plays into that because now we have the earth repair port. And if you want to start doing bioremediation, then you need to start building a relationship with the fungi. Uh, and that's where the mushroom course uh, comes in. So just wanted to kind of link those three courses together and how they play in this greater conversation. So I think the links are all uh, out there. I think Charles is going to send them out afterwards. Uh, I'd mentioned the mushroomcourse.com and the wild 30. So just remember, if you enter wild 30, you get $30 off plus the exchange. And uh, yeah, we got a lot of work to do. Um, but if we reframe our relationship with what these disasters are and what it means to be on this planet, uh, I, I think there's a lot of amazing possibilities out there. And that, that really inspires me. So and we probably should wrap just in respect for everybody here. Um, though, if people want to stay on after a little bit in the chat some more, you know, like uh, it's the sad part I miss in 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 person classes where you have the class and you like do the class thing, you end it, and then like you end up like hanging around for fifteen minutes afterwards, kind of chatting about everything that was up and kind of like. So if people want to chat chat afterwards, we will stick around for a little bit. Um, uh, Yeah, Kim, I, I hear you. The exchange where it gets hard, but it works the other way around. So, um, yeah, but we'll, Kim, um, if people are really wanting to do a class, uh, I will commit to working with you to figure a way to make it possible. Um, so, we have to set the prices. The exchange rate is never going to be great, like, or not never going to be great. Right now, it is not great for going that way. But if somebody really, if you are interested in one of these classes and it's, economically prohibitive, but you're really excited about doing it. Um, I'm gonna put my email in here. Uh, write me, we'll figure something out. Awesome, well, thanks so much, everybody. I'm just kind of skimming through here. I know there's a bunch of questions at the beginning. Um, I kind of forget what, what some of the main ones were coming uh, through, but. There was one about preserving mushrooms. Um, oh yeah. There, um, uh, and then there was one about one that wasn't answered it was like what mushrooms are you feeding your worms okay yeah so. i can answer a couple quick for those that want to hang around for a second um so my favorite way to preserve them is actually drying them because it doesn't require refrigeration um and what we do so these are this is a jar of shiitake mushrooms right here uh, one of my favorite ones to grow we grow these uh mostly on logs and um, so what we do when we harvest them, we actually lay them out in the sun the day that we harvest them. And vitamin, our mushrooms will actually absorb more vitamin D out of the sun rays into the mushrooms if you lay them in the sun for a little bit. So we'll start off by laying them out in the sun, letting them absorb in that extra sun energy. And then we'll basically just dry them either in a dehydrator or just on a screen in a back room with a fan going over top of it. And then all winter long, we put these into our soup stocks, um, and we also do, we do an amazing mushroom chai. Um, and it's a mixture of our grown mushrooms and then also quite a few of the forage ones. So reishi, um, chaga, um, 
we don't actually use a lot of chaga anymore. I have a lot of concerns about chaga maybe being over harvested because of how trendy it is. And there's so many other mushrooms that are have all very similar compounds, you know, our foamies, fomenteris, like our horse hoof mushrooms and uh, our birch polypore. So anyways, we harvest all these wild ones, cut them all in slices, we dry them. And then all winter long, we either put them in soup stocks or we put them into our teas and our mushroom chais. So that's the one way we do it. We do also freeze some as well. If you're going to freeze them, you want to cook them slightly first. You don't want to freeze them raw. So we'll just throw them on a baking sheet and a little bit of oil, like in some avocado oil or something, and throw them in the oven. And just, just for like kind of like five, 10 minutes in the oven, just so they start to kind of shrink up a little bit. And then we'll, we'll put them in the oven or sorry, put them into the freezer that way. And then those ones are a bit nicer to just rehydrate if you're throwing them in like stir fries and stuff like that. So those are the two main ways that we preserve our mushrooms. Um, what was the other question you said? Uh, what ones do you, what uh, uh, mushroom um, do you feed your worms? You said that you use oh. your spent mushrooms. Yeah, so this one's really a really cool cycle. So I, you know, one of the probably least sustainable food choices that I absolutely love is my coffee. I do my best to buy, you know, fair trade and good quality that comes from a good place, but I love coffee. Um, so in the winter, we actually take our spent coffee grinds and we grow oyster mushrooms out of our spent coffee grinds. Then I take, so you get kind of two, three, maybe four flushes off of your coffee grinds. Then I take those coffee grinds with the mycelium in it and I drop that into my worm composters. And then the worms are eating the, not only the spent coffee grinds, the mycelium there as well. And it's basically supercharging that worm food. I do though, I also grow in uh, straw indoors in the winter time. So I grow in five gallon buckets and then I pop holes in it. Um, and I will too, same kind of thing. You know, I'll get kind of three, four flushes out of the straw. Now, if it's in the summertime when that straw is done, I'll actually go and put it in a garden bed with more straw and mulch because it'll actually start to regrow again and re kind of bring back its vitality and start to produce more mushrooms outside. It's so cool what you can do with mushrooms once you start understanding what they work. Uh, but in the winter time, the indoor ones will also take the straw and we'll put that into our vermicomposters as well. So, um, you know, also just taking that straw that's also been used and just putting it on your garden beds, even if it doesn't regrow mushrooms. Um, you know, I, I, hopefully a lot of you know about the benefits of mulching with straw on garden beds for building soil for basically it takes like kind of a desert and it turns it into an ecosystem the same way that leaves do that on the forest floor. And suddenly it brings in all the good organisms. It brings in the microbes, the fungus. And now you have an ecosystem. So you have beneficial organisms building the soil, but also keeping pests done. So you can do that with straw on its own. But when you put the mycelium spent straw on there, then you're also adding that into the ecosystem as well. Um, so it's, it's building the soil even quicker and even better. So that, that's kind of what we do with it. How easy are they to cultivate? It really depends on the species. Oyster mushrooms and wine caps, I would suggest. And so if you're going to grow outdoors in logs, uh, shiitake is a great one. Um, if you want to grow indoors or if you want to grow in garden beds, I would suggest wine caps as your starting point. But oysters and wine caps and shiitake are all fairly easy. When you get into like lion's mane and mataki and reishi, it gets quite a bit more complex. Um, but, but I would say that, you know, there, there's definitely some tricks. Uh, I've had a lot of failed batches and a lot of mistakes. So that's one reason you might want to think about checking out the course if you want to uh, shorten your learning curve. You know, I've definitely had things go moldy. One of the most common mistakes we get in my course actually is people will be like, oh, Chris, I just threw out all my stuff and they'll send me a picture and they just threw it out and they thought their mycelium was mold. I don't know how many people I've seen that have sent me pictures and they're like, oh man, look at my straw. It all went moldy. So I threw it out or my coffee went moldy. So I threw it out. I'm like, no, that's mycelium. That's what it's supposed to look like. It kind of looks like mold when it starts growing. But you know, these are the kinds of videos we have in the course where I'm like, hey, this is what mold looks like. This is what my white mycelium looks like um, when we're getting going there. So and they're all fungi, fun, fungi. So, you know, I think you're, you're all working in the same, mm -hmm. but we should um, take a moment and just say thank you um, to everybody. And we can continue afterwards, but I just want to like, create a moment to be like thank you everybody for coming uh, earth Life training really appreciates this and um chris for um bringing bringing this together i want to also thank the admin team that's behind all this that we rarely see during this all the support people um so big appreciation to uh, both elizabeth and mariah on the earth Life training side uh, for all their support in this uh, and starhawk 
Um, I want to give a thank to the elements that provide life for us all. Um, so um, to all the elements, the sun and the moon and the earth that hold us. Oh. So, blessings to that. And thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope you have enjoyed your time here. As I said, you can stay on. I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, so this is kind of the formal closing it all. Um, but with chats more, and if you like any of these courses or are interested, um, you can check out um, SCOGA. You can check out Earth Actors Training. We have some great things coming up. Thanks, everybody. And to all the unsaid things that weren't mentioned in our, our gratitude. Mm -hmm.